Welcome to my review of Judge Anderson, Year One by Alec Worley. This could be a long one, go get some snacks. The footage shown on screen during this review comes from the ASMR show, who I let loose on some of my 2018 collections so that you could see that I am a fan, and while not as encyclopedic as I'm sure some of the fans out there are, I do have some idea of what I'm talking about. So, Alec Worley is a jobbing writer for 2000 AD, of which I'm insanely jealous, but I'll try not to let my hate lead to unnecessary suffering and remain objective. Off the top of my head, this may be the only book I've read in the last couple of years that's contemporary, being published in 2017. However, that's not strictly true, as it's actually a collection of Worley's three novellas and a short, some of which date back to 2015. Worley signs off his introduction with P.S. It's all canon, baby, which is either a threat or a tragic indication of the collapse in standards over at 2000 AD. What he should have said was, it's all a cash-in, baby. This quote from the back cover, for example, attempts to connect the book to the film Dread that was released in 2012, a film that, despite its many qualities, didn't make any money or bring about any kind of renaissance for 2000 AD. Not only that, but to connect to the film, well, it's five years too late. It should have been released concurrently. So it's debatable if it's dreadful marketing or pointless marketing, but it's undeniably an attempted cash-in, as the book is set in the Dread universe of the comics, not the film. Additionally, we already have this story, or at least The Adventures of Cadet Anderson, drawn by the mighty Carlos Esquera, is available in a number of formats. The cover art isn't original either, being a slightly reworked version of Gary Brown's cover to Prog 1734. Despite being marketed as an Anderson novel, the small print fesses up to the fact it's actually an omnibus of previously published work. The first story, Heartbreaker, has Anderson investigating murders at a dating agency which captures some of the quirkiness of the comic book Mega City 1, but from the off you can see that this book is going to fail. Here's your first line. Zack placed Rena's synthy calf on the table and smiled. Rena snarled and thrust her fork into his eye. Wally is trying to create an unexpected opening to grab the attention but without a frame of reference is just violence. It's also completely perfunctory, not only do we not know who these people are, we don't really know where they are. We assume a cafe, but it could equally be at home over breakfast. It's quite simple to rectify this. Have the first line Zack ordering that coffee make him nervous. He's on a first date, as we learn later. Well, let's get inside his head. He's nervous because it's going well. He's having a good time. He thinks he likes Rena. He thinks she likes him. You can do all of this in a paragraph. If you want some humour, he can stammer over his nerves. The checkout girl can laugh. The checkout droid can react with indifference or confusion, his knees can be knocking together. Then we have a human that we care about. If we believe his date is going well, then the eye stabbing becomes even more unexpected and even more shocking. The only sense of threat in the novel, which is never really developed very well, is the idea that Anderson is not very good at her job and might be rejected by the Justice Department. Well, we know that this is not going to happen, nor is it developed for example like Top Gun, where Tom Cruise's character reaches his lowest ebb before turning it all around, which is basic storytelling. We know Anderson is going to make it, give her a partner, or put her in a class of rookies so we can root for them all, or, or not, if some of them are just not up to it. The tirade that Anderson launches into against her bosses on page 272 is completely out of character as well. Anderson is famously flippant and referred to the chief judge as CJ, but she still followed the chain of command. The deviations in, in the better stories were either much more like a bending of the rules than a breaking of them, or they were done for the greater good. This is more like arrogance and belongs to a different young adult book that I'll get to in a bit. Anderson develops a new superpower, throwing cybolts about. Naturally, from a language point of view, this is a phrase without synonyms, so it becomes repetitive. The nearest I can remember to a cybolt in the comics was from Lucid, a 2005 story from Alan Grant. Not only is this set 35 years after her first appearance, which was not as a rookie, remember, but I have two issues with this. Firstly, I don't recall prior to Lucid her doing this, please, 2000 AD fans, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but secondly, I always saw images like this one, which is from the same series, but will not necessarily be unfamiliar to Anderson readers. I see this as more metaphorical, that these people were aspiring with their mental strength, and it was represented this way because comics are a visual medium. Well, books are not so much, so Worley could and should have handled this better. The villain of this section of the book responds by throwing black arrows. Again, a phrase with little in the way of a thesaurus entry. The net result is their battles are monotonous in prose, and obviously predictable in outcome. It does not make for an exciting read. The second story, The Abyss, covers a terrorist attack on the Psych Cubes, which has similarities to Alan Grant's Anderson story, Lock-In, that was published in the magazine in 2005. The first line is, The cold air stank of piss and garbage. Sigh. 
really somebody do a lexical search on the work of charles dickens and see if he ever wrote anything as lazy and out of place in a novel as that that's on page 129 133 includes this gem he was shaking like a virgin about to get laid this section of the book is kind of a horror story really just a resident evil knockoff but the only horror i felt was that trash like that made it into print I'll just add further to that, this phrase is from a judge's point of view, and judges are forbidden to have sexual relations, so the only person in that room you can be certain is a virgin is the judge thinking it. So it's horribly out of place and anachronistic, as well as being lazy and awful. The final story, The Dream of the Never Time, has a psychic mutant trying to replace Mega City 1 with a dead version of itself, and, via the android version of John Wayne, it tries and fails to employ a little humour. Warley's writing style is mostly functional, and his stories do include a commendable effort to try and capture the megacity magic and whimsy that helps make Dredd and Anderson so great. That in itself has not been especially consistent in the pages of 2000 AD over the last 20 years, so he cannot be held entirely responsible for falling a little short. His obvious passion for the world does come across, but his limitations and failings mark this as merely average fan fiction. Being non-canon and not priced at £8, it probably wouldn't garner much attention. The main issue that torpedoes Year One is that Warley, despite being the author of an article entitled Five Reasons I Love Judge Anderson, just gets his lead wrong. In this book, she's basically Selena Sardothian. Even judges fall in love with her. She's aloof, she's an indestructible killing machine, etc, etc. Basically, she's Superman in a world with no Lois Lane to protect, no Lex Luthor, no General Zod, and no Kryptonite. It's kind of taboo in young adult fiction to write a female character with any kind of weakness, and that's part of the reason why female characters in young adult fiction are boring as hell to anyone over the age of 12. Strangely, this is something Warling mentions in his introduction, asking, how exciting would Die Hard be if John McClane was bulletproof? Yet he still has Anderson charging unarmed into a room full of hardened criminals. I'm going to assume he's never actually seen Die Hard and how John McClane survived by running away and picking his battles, where necessary, with opportunism. So let's look at his five reasons. 1. She's human. This, this isn't really correct. Anderson is a judge. She's more human than Dread, but so is the chair I'm sat on. Warley has his time scales wrong here. It wasn't until the Jesus Syndrome in 1993 that Anderson's stories began to descend into philosophizing and morality. Her first appearance was way back in 1980. Between that time, she showed little of the later hand-wringing when she helped Dredd wipe out the entire Soviet bloc, for example. Cadet Anderson, while not exactly a highlight of the canon, represents her as much more focused. This is something Garland got right in the film. What are you waiting for, rookie? Bang. This is Anderson. She's a judge first and a human second, until the later stories anyway. Two, she's funny. Kind of. Unless saying, see you later, adjudicator, to Dredd is hilarious to you. She's certainly more effective as a comparison to Dredd, who is unflinchingly dour. However, there's little humour in most of the stories beyond the occasional pithy remark. The example Warley gives in his essay is Anderson blasting wise-cracking demons with a glib, Hi X. I don't see that as funny, more as a contradiction of the claim that Anderson in his early days was particularly human. This move is, after all, one of Dredd's. Number three, she's psychic, yes, but Warley gets this wrong as well, as we've discussed with the Cybolts. But in the early books, she was less bothered by the jumbled voices of the city, where here she's regularly overwhelmed. I will accept that she may have learned to shut out the voices over the years, but it's worth pointing out that Judge Corey was the empath, Anderson the telepath. The depiction here is more akin to Anderson after Corey's death, which was in the sci-fi special in 1989. There are people, by the way, who will be able to tell you better than me how these years that I'm giving tie into the timescales of the Dread universe, but for lay people like myself, it's enough to say they run sort of con consecutively and are something like 130 years ahead. The exception being things like Cadet Anderson and this, which are explicitly prequels. Number four, she kicks ass. Well, yes, but this book and Cadet Anderson overplay this hand. Anderson is very capable, but she isn't dread. The aforementioned scene where she pummels a room full of crooks is a good example. In his introduction, Wally says, a young girl, Mossad trained, can take down five people. Yes, if they're five slobs with doughy bowling pin bodies, and then by speed, technique, and guile, not by raw strength, and not against five hardened criminals. But she throws down like Gina Carano. Well, this girl is not fighting like this girl. 
And yes, we have seen Anderson depicted like this, but it's interesting that even in this book, she only fights barehanded with one person, the Soviet assassin Orlok, who takes her to the cleaners. Anderson was always good with her fists, but she was never an unstoppable fighter. In the better stories, she won by using her brains. She defeated the entity that thought it was Satan with a riddle. The people of Deadworld used her as a conduit to defeat Judge Death. In The Possessed, she prevented the demon invasion by shooting the innocent sacrifice. In Wally's book, she'd have pummeled that room full of demons and then carried that boy out of there on her back, broken leg and all. In Childhood's End, the removal of Anderson's weapons makes her more vulnerable. In Wally's book, it makes no difference at all. Number five, she's not perfect. Well, not really true either. She's not a perfect judge, nor a perfect human, but a perfect combination of the two. Or again, she was in the early stories. She shoots Hammy the human sacrifice with a tear in her eye. She blinks it off on the next page. Basically, she takes the right moral path every time, even when those decisions are incredibly difficult. What Wally gets wrong is that his Anderson is physically perfect, indestructible, and yet racked by emotional torment over every little thing. The balance of judge and human is wrong. I'm sure people will say that she learned that balance, this is her year one after all. But I'll point to where in A Dream of the Never Time she is part of a bust and fingers man completely unconnected to it because he's recently served only four months for a sexual assault and she felt that was too lenient. So let's consider for a moment how many times in the pages of 2000 AD where judges have been shown to be too lenient. It's not many, is it? Then we can consider that this man had served his time. According to the rules of society, anyway, he'd paid his debt. Now he's punished for something he's innocent of, without even what passes for due process in Mega City 1. Not only that, but doing this hinders the mission they're actually on rather than helps it. It's morally reprehensible, and even in its own world, it's obviously wrong. Only the most crooked judge would do this, certainly not Anderson, who has to be our moral compass, which is again something Morley points out in his article, but doesn't realise appropriately in his book. The link to Warley's article is in the description. If you agree with him or with me, you might like this book more or less. Aside from the couple of things I pointed out earlier, there is nothing much that is especially awful, but that doesn't make it worth your earth money either. Part of the problem is that this is a prequel. We know Anderson isn't going to die. Give Anderson a partner or a mentor, somebody we care about, not the fleeting antagonistic appearance of Judge Xena in the Abyss. Give us somebody to fear for, as well as somebody to root for, otherwise your backstory is better left as just that. If Wally had got his own five points right, if he'd found a way to connect his three stories into one whole, if the action carried a threat or tension, if Anderson relied more on her brains than a teenage girl's muscles, basically if he'd written an entirely different book, it probably wouldn't have been much better because he's just not up to the job. Back in 2006-2007, Michael Scanlon wrote three Anderson novels, Fear the Darkness, Red Shadows, and Sins of the Father. It's been a while since I read them, and I recall at the time thinking that they needed a better editor. However, I also remember them as being, while subpar in the plot department, a much better depiction of the character overall, which in an Anderson novel is priority number one. I recommend them over this, and this only to fans of internet fan fiction. Thank you for listening. Embrace your inner child and press all those buttons down below, especially the like, subscribe and bell ones. I have other reviews you may enjoy as well.